can't, I can't talk anymore. We're on recording now. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we come to you, we do want to make much of you. And as we focus on prayer, it just seems sometimes that as we pray and as we're out um, inviting people to church and sharing our faith, it just seems like we're pushing against a huge old boulder. Father, we need your strength. We need your patience. And we need your love to flow through us. We all have concerns, whether it's finances, whether it's a, a tough week ahead of us, whether it's, uh, is pastor going to stop early enough so my food doesn't burn at home? I just pray that right now our minds and our hearts would be calm before you so we would have, we would receive, excuse me, what you have for us. In your name we pray. Amen. This week in our I Pray series, I Pray Does It Matter? Ever been there? I mean, it just seems it doesn't matter how long you're on your knees. Some of you think you want to take up those, those early monks and start grabbing a whip and flogging yourself, thinking maybe God will listen then, right? No, I've never went there, I tell you that. But, you know, there, there were those monks in Martin Luther's day that they would, you know, hit themselves over the back or, or go into all sorts of things, you know, a vow of silence to show God they were serious. But I pray, and does it matter? I mean, sometimes if we're honest, we ask that question. Bubba. I used Bubba. I was going to use Redneck Jeff, but I found out Jeff was going to be here, and I didn't want him to think I was talking about him. So I just picked it out of the air, so I went to Bubba, all right? Bubba decided he was going to build him a shed. Not just any shed, but a redneck man shed. I mean, it was going to have everything in there. He needed a place for his toys, you know, for his bass boat, for his four-wheeler, for his, you know, F-150 Shelby Special Edition Titanium Blue truck. Not that I've thought about it, but that would be in Bubba's shed. You know, and, and all his tools and everything like that. So he was going to build him a shed, and he took pencil to napkin, and he drew the best layout for any redneck bubble shed you can make. I mean, he had it down to the reclaimed wood walls, you know. Everyone's doing all those pallet reclaiming there. I mean, he had this thing decked out. So he set out to build the perfect redneck shed getaway. He got his, his form set up, and he poured the concrete. And then after pouring the concrete and having achy arms and back he decided to call some of his friends to help him put up the walls and work on the inside. And sure enough, piece by piece, over time, Bubba built the incredible redneck getaway. I mean, it was so good. It had a panel of TVs. He had the bathroom, you know, that bathroom that you saw like on Tool Man Tim, you know, that had a recliner for a toilet seat. You know, so when you eat all that cheese and you have to be there a little bit longer, you're, you're not going to be uncomfortable. He even put one-way glass in the bathroom so he could still watch the TVs. I mean, the guy thought of everything. But then Bubba noticed there was a crack forming in his concrete. And he thought nothing of it. That's where he pulled his trucks and his, and his, and his boats and everything. And after all, fishing was good, so he was going over it a lot. That crack would just go away. But over time, that crack got larger. So Bubba did what every good redneck does, is he found a way to just cover up the crack, and he poured some stuff in it, and sure enough, the crack was filled. But the crack grew larger again. <coughs> Bubba got concerned, so he asked a friend uh, about the concrete. Why is my concrete cracking? Well, he went to a friend, and the friend asked him when he poured it, told him when he poured it. He said, well, the temperature should have done. He goes, what would you use for reinforcement? Bubba goes, reinforcement? I use concrete. I don't need to be reinforced concrete. You see, Bubba wanted to build Bubba's perfect getaway. But what Bubba didn't do was Bubba didn't get the information he needed to lay a good foundation and a good solid floor for that getaway. And when stress came to that concrete, when the weather changed, when weight changed, when something would shift underneath, because in Oklahoma, after all, we're getting a lot of those earthquakes, right? His floor cracked. Prayer is like the rebar 
or, or, or the chicken wire or, or even if you use the fiber uh, concrete that some guys use instead of having to use different stuff. Whatever, you need reinforcement. And you don't see that reinforcement when the concrete's poured, but if that reinforcement isn't there, it's going to show up. I pray, does it matter? Does it matter if there's rebar or reinforcement in concrete? You bet it does. You bet your prayer life matters. You don't fully, we don't fully understand or appreciate the effects of prayer in our life until it's pulled away. I have often said this, and I'll, I'll repeat it every, every time, maybe one of the biggest testimonies I have coming out of my cancer is the power of prayer. Because I can tell you the time when most people stop praying for me. Because I literally felt it. I literally felt it. After I was home from my, from my transplant, from my stem cell transplant, and the praise God went over my blog, the praise God went out for my parents and everyone else who was praying for me, you know, everyone took a breath, and all of a sudden, depression started setting in stronger than it ever had. All of a sudden, worry and doubts and concerns, will this come back? Will I make it through the rest of these things I still need to go through? Started setting in. I could tell when the power of prayer was removed from my life. Prayer is that powerful. Bubba skipped a step in building his floor. Do we skip the step of praying in our lives before we set out to do what we think is God's will? On Sunday nights, we're discussing that very thing in experiencing God. That we should not move anywhere or do anything that God has not first shown himself to be moving. Oftentimes we try and, and we head out and say, we're going to do these things for God. And then as we get into it, we say, oh, God, by the way, bless our efforts. Not even knowing if that's the effort that God wants us in. Well, I found some examples in the Bible. Imagine that. About prayer and does it matter? And maybe some questions that, that all of us have had. Maybe we'll discuss them and, and come up with some answers. I pray, does it matter? Well, does it matter if I have known sin in my life? Does it matter if I pray and I have known sin in my life? Well, in Psalm 66, verse 16 through 19, he says, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened, and he has attended to the voice of my prayer. David said here that it does matter if we have known sin in our lives and we try and go before God in prayer. He says, if I had regarded iniquity in my life. In other words, if I had known, <coughs> excuse me, that I have failed God, that I had done something outside of his standard for my life, he says he's not going to listen to me. Now, before you get on on the soapbox and say, wait a minute, God's not God if he can't hear certain things. You're right. David's not saying that God couldn't hear his prayer. What David is saying, he cannot pray in power if he knows he is hiding sin in his life. I, I love my wife dearly. This year we'll be celebrating 25 years if we make it to August. There's still a chance we might not. But if we make it to August 3rd, it'll be 25 glorious years. And all of my kids have been saving money in their savings account to throw us a big shindig, right, Autumn? No. <clears throat> 25 years. When I have crossed my wife, whether it is crimes of omission, in other words, I didn't know I crossed her, or when I crossed her on purpose because I figured it was easier to ask forgiveness than permission. Some of my requests for dinner would go unanswered. Does that make sense? Even though we have a relationship, even though I have a piece of paper that says she's mine till she dies or I die. And she reminds me I could die. In fact, my health is worse than hers. Even though I have the power of relationship, even though I have the power of a legally binding document, that relationship is strained, and my authority in the relationship is messed up. Oh, but when the relationship is good, 
You know, then it's, honey, dear, sweetie, what can I fix you for supper tonight, my love? I don't know if I've ever heard those words like that. And she's in nursery today. See, that's how I can get away with this. Not for long. You can't pray with authority, guys, if you're holding sin in your life. In the Lord's Prayer, we're going to cover that a little bit next week, and I don't want to jump ahead. But he literally says, if you're not forgiving others, don't expect God to forgive you. You can't pray if we're still holding on to unforgiveness. If we're holding on to iniquity, David said, God would not have heard my prayer. While we're on David, let's look at another example from David's life. I pray, does it matter? Even if I have sinned and am experiencing God's discipline. Does it matter if I pray even when I've sinned and I'm experiencing God's discipline? If you've been in church for very long, you know the story of David and Bathsheba. You know, first of all, David messed up in in the whole beginning of the story because when you read the story there, (coughs) it says in the time that the kings were to go out to war, David was in his palace. In other words, David should have been out at war. Instead, he got proud. He sent out his men, told them what to do, all they can handle it, and he stayed back. And while he was walking on the roof of his palace, again, where he shouldn't have been, he looks over and he sees Bathsheba. And he covets her. He lusts after her. Takes her. And she gets pregnant. He says, man, she's a married woman. Her husband, Uriah, was serving in his military. He basically had his commander kill Uriah. Pulled away from him in a battle. David thought he got away with it. Everything was covered up. Ah, but God knew, didn't he? God got on the height line to his prophet Nathaniel. And he said, you need to go talk to David. Because David sinned mightily. And there's some consequences coming his way. And what he told him is that your son is going to die because of your sin. Oh, David knew, once the story was, was presented, that he had been found out. He knew that he had sinned. But now, the cost of that sin. You know, we can always make our own choices, right? We, we get to choose, but we don't get to choose the consequences. Well, the prophet said, David, you're going to lose your son. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we had the second half of this discussion. And it reads like this. It says, And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David, therefore, sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted and went in and lay night, excuse me, and lay all night on the ground. (coughs) And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. Seven days. Seven days, David entreated God, even though he knew the sentence was going to be death for that child because of his sin. David believed in the power of prayer. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him the child is dead? He may do himself harm. Now, I want to stop there because he's the king. You're right. He may do himself harm. But I think those cats were afraid for their own lives. After all, his son had died. Well, if his son had died, and that was his own flesh and blood and precious to him, David might lash out at someone that he could take their life, huh? After all, he'd taken your eyes. A little bit of fear there, I'll bet, on those guys as well. Verse 19. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servant, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house. And when he had asked, they set food before him and ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and you wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? 
but now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Notice, even though David knew the answer to his prayer, even though God had told him through the prophet Nathaniel that his son would die, David knew he served and worshipped a gracious and merciful God, and he still prayed even though he knew he was living under the consequences of his choices, of his sin. Does it matter? Should I pray when I know I'm going through a trial, when I know I am receiving the harvest of the crop that I sown? Absolutely, you better pray because you serve a gracious and merciful God. Notice what David did after his child died. He went around and he kicked bushes, right? He found a dog to kick. He went and he cried with his wife. Is that what it says here? <coughs> it says David got up and he cleaned himself and he got some food, right? You know, he did do that, but what did he do first? He worshipped the Lord. He worshipped the Lord. To me, that shows strength of a guy who truly had spent seven days not lying on the ground just sleeping, but seven days praying and spending time with God. He was able to understand that his son may have died, but one day he will be with his son, with God in heaven. And that brought him comfort. One day, um, uh, granddad was going over to see his grandson. And they knew he was coming. But the little boy was acting up. And he was put into timeout. You know, that's kind of the recourse we have if we don't want to spank. He got into timeout. And, and, and it was still during, did they still even make playpen? I figured they outlawed those things because it would be like caging kids because you can't cage chickens anymore. You, I don't know if they still let us cage our kids. But they had a playpen, all right? And, and granddad came over and he looked for his grandson and his daughter explained to him, nope, he's in timeout. You've got to leave him alone, dad. He's under punishment. And she went in and was fixing dinner. And, and, and as she looked around, her dad was gone. Couldn't find him. Called out to him. He didn't say a thing. So she went looking through the house. Came into the room where her son was in the playpen. And sure enough, right there next to her son in the playpen was Grandpa. Playing with his grandson. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God could not stand to be away from us. David knew that. Even though he was sin, even though David was in timeout, he cherished his time with God. God loves us so much that even in our despair, even in times of discipline, he is always, always near third point this morning i pray does it matter when everyone else thinks i'm crazy now i'm not trying to look at anyone when i say that but that ought to bring some of you guys a lot of comfort i pray it matters even when everyone else thinks i'm crazy even when everyone else thinks i'm out of my head it matters that i should pray and a lot of times i pray it this way god I know they don't see it yet. I hope one day you enlighten them as to how much you are moving me in this method. One day you all will understand how important an F-150 Shelby special edition titanium blue truck will be. My example for this <coughs> is in uh, Samuel as well. It's in 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we'll look at an extended passage there, verses 1 through 17. It says there was a certain man named Ramathame, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoph, and Epaphrodite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peniah. Peniah. Da, da, da. Man, there's a lot of ends in there, isn't there? And Peniah had, ch had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship 
and his sacrifice to the Lord of hosts of Shiloh, there were two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. At her rival, used to poke at her and grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. In other words, year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? I'm going to stop right there. Man, you need to understand this. When women won't eat, when women just are down and in their room, it's time for you to go out to the Bubba Shed. Because even though Elkanah tried to do his best to console her, even though she knew she was the apple of her husband's eye, she had a pain that was so deep and so severe that even he couldn't do anything about it. Hannah knew that. How do I know that? Because we're going to read on and we're going to see what Hannah did. And we're going to see how God responded. After they had eaten and, and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Verse 10. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Have you ever wept before God bitterly? God, I don't understand. God, all these things keep coming up. It seems as soon as I step one foot on a rung and then I get my foot ready to step on the next rung, that rung breaks. She says she wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son. Notice, she didn't just pray for a child. She said, give me a son. She was bold enough to tell God exactly what she wanted. If you'll give me a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Again, isn't it like people who don't understand God, when they see the people of God praying and seeking God, they think we're drunk and out of our mind. Think I'm wrong? What happened at Pentecost? What happened when when God came down? Ah, they're just uneducated fishermen. Then they start speaking in tongues. What was their statement? Oh, they're drunk fishermen now. No, they weren't drunk. It was too early in the morning. Not even fishermen get drunk that early. They always try and excuse things away. Eli tried that. But Hannah answered, verse 15, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out my great anxiety and vexation. That's a good word, vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. Reading from the book of Samuel, you can imagine the name of the boy that God gave to Hannah. Once Samuel had been weaned, we read on in Samuel that Hannah took her son and left him with Eli. That's a committed woman. That's a woman who said, God, do you hear me? I'm praying year after year, even though people are making fun of me, even though my pastor doesn't understand, I keep coming before you. God, will you respond? And God finally responded. (coughs) Eli thought she was drunk. Because of the passion, because of the way that she prayed and interceded before God for this request. I wonder if someone watched us pray, would they get it? I'm not talking if if you pray in tongues or if you believe in that. I'm not talking about uh, are you praying slow and do you enunciate. 
and do you use the proper English or the proper vernacular for where you are? I wonder if someone watched you pray, would they believe that you really knew who you were talking to and that you believed that he would respond? Do you pray, do we pray with a passion, believing that God will answer? I want to close with a, with a short story or poem. I don't know what you call it. It's been around for a while. For a while. Next slide. A man was sleeping one night in his cabin when suddenly his room filled with light and God appeared. The Lord told the man he had a work for him to do and showed him a large rock in the front of his cabin. The Lord explained that the man was to push against the rock with all his might. So this man did, day after day. For many years he toiled from sunup to sundown, his shoulders set squarely against the cold, massive surface of the unmoving rock, pushing with all of his might. Each night the man returned to his cabin, sore and wore out, feeling that this whole day had been spent in vain. Since the man was showing discouragement, the adversary, Satan, decided to enter the picture by placing thoughts into this weary mind. You have been pushing against that rock for a long time, and it hasn't moved. Thus he gave the man the impression, impression that the task was impossible and that he was a failure. The thoughts discouraged and disheartened the man. Satan then said, why kill yourself over this? Just put in your time, give just the minimum effort, and that'll be good enough. That's what the weary man planned to do, but decided to make it a matter of prayer and to take the troubled thoughts to the Lord. Lord, he said, I have labored long and hard in your service, putting all my strength to do all that you have asked. Yet, after all this time, I have not even budged that rock a half a millimeter. What is wrong? Why am I failing? The Lord responded compassionately. My friend, when I asked you to serve me and you accepted, I told you that your task was to push against the rock with all of your strength, which you have done. Never once did I mention that I expected you to move it. Your task was to push. And now you come to me with your strength spent, thinking that you have failed. But is that really so? Look at yourself. Your arms are strong and muscled. Your back is sinewy and brown. Your hands are calloused from constant pressure. Your legs have become massive and hard. Through opposition, you have grown much. And your abilities now surpass that which you used to have. True, you haven't moved the rock. But your calling was to be obedient and to push, and to exercise your faith and trust in my wisdom, and that you have done. Now I, my friend, will move the rock. At times, when we fear a word from God, when we tend to use our own intellect to decipher what He meant or what He wants, when actually what God wants from us is just simple obedience and faith in Him, by all means, Exercise the faith that moves mountains, but know that it is still God who moves that mountain. When everything seems to go wrong, push. When everything seems to get you down, push. When people don't react the way you think they should, push. When your money is gone and the bills are due, push. When people don't just understand. Push. You figured out what push stands for? Pray until something happens. That cement can be strong. The rock and the sand and the water mixture and and all of that can be strong. But without the reinforcement, it will not stand the pressure of weather and weight of time. Oftentimes, people don't see the prayer warriors in our church, but they're there. Prayer is what holds a Christian together. Prayer is what gives a Christian strength 
to make it through when God gives us a monumental task of moving the boulder, of reaching keys in the surrounding areas for Christ, we're not going to do it. God is going to do it if we're faithful and if we pray, asking Him to intervene. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, this morning, as we've discussed prayer, and does it really matter I mean, we always throw up those prayers before we run into the car in front of us or about the test that we haven't studied for or or we even pray for those that are in the hospital. But, Father, sometimes I think we're throwing those prayers up just out of repetition. And then it's easy for Satan to come in and discourage us. You've been praying for this a long time and you've seen nothing happen. Your God's not listening. Father, please protect us from the accuser. I pray that you would put up walls and keep Satan out as Keys Baptist Church seeks to be a church that comes before your throne boldly and repetitively for you to move in people's lives. Forgive us when we think that we're going to move those boulders. Forgive us when we think it was our efforts that got us through this trial. Father, give us the stamina through your Holy Spirit to always trust in you and seek you in prayer. Before I close this morning, I don't know your heart. There may be someone here this morning who has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If that's you, and if when I talk about that, you don't even know what that means, I hope before you leave today that you find someone and ask them what that means. Grab me after church. I would love to explain to you What it means to have a personal relationship with God to know that if you died, you would be in heaven. Christian, maybe you're carrying something you're not supposed to. Maybe your weeks have turned into months. Maybe your months have seemed like decades. And prayer seems to elude you. You wonder, is God really listening? I challenge you this morning to renew your commitment to being a praying Christian, seeking God's divine intervention, and and wisdom in your situation. Before I close, these two benches up front aren't just there to fill up the empty space up here. We believe in prayer. We believe that when we put our feet into action and kneel before God, that He responds. If you need to come up and pray, feel free to use the kneeling benches and leave your issues with God and know that He will respond. Father, now as we, res- we head into a time of invitation, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have free reign, free movement in our lives. If we need to respond to a, to a call you've placed in our lives, that today we would set our standard and say, from this day on, I'm moving forward with what God has set before me. Forgive our weakness in faith. In your name I pray. Amen.